and sisters as we resume our studies in the book of Judges. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and that we may be granted the wisdom to understand the symbols that are being presented before us and their relation to that which we are encountering today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to assemble together, to delve into your word, to learn more of your character, and to observe the symbols that are presented before us. Help us today. May your spirit be with us. We ask that you send your angels to protect us so that our minds may be clear, that we may be able to receive that which we are soon to read. That as we do so, we may be able to discuss, to learn, to be edified by all that is being presented. Help us to this end. Be with those that are here for this, for this appointment with you. Be with those that will view this later on video. Direct us, we ask. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, when we last assembled, we had been going through this portion of the book of Judges. Judges 8, verse 6. We had, and we are looking at a situation. Because Gideon and his armies have been going against this threefold union. Gideon asks assistance, sustenance, from the princes of Sukkoth. And the princes of Sukkoth said, Are the Heba and Zalmunna now in thine hand that we should give bread unto thine army? It's almost like saying, What have you done? You haven't caught these guys. Why should we feed you? You haven't helped us. You haven't protected us. And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into mine hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness with the and when he went up thence to Penuel and spake unto them likewise and the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Sukkoth had answered him and he spake also unto the men of Penuel saying when I come again in peace I will break down this tower now we left off at this part of the study because as we go into the next verse, verse 10, we are starting another segment, another section. Mm -hmm. Now, we were looking at this portion because we have had experiences with others within the movement, within the church, speaking to them about different things that we are seeing, and we are, have been rejected. So here is Gideon. Gideon is of the least of the families of Manasseh. They are the tiniest portion. Gideon has been threshing the grain at the at the area of the wine press because the Midianites would not look for him there. What symbols did we apply to the Midianites? Well, as far as being the enemy, um, they are a relative. So are we applying that the church is the Midianites? I think so. Um, 
I haven't actually thought about it for a while, but I think that's what we had concluded. So, but, it, but I mean, it's it when we look at the enemies, the enemies are not so much individuals or even organizations, they are messages, right? Or teachings or doctrines. So it would be a doctrine that comes from the church, at least. What did we determine the names of Zeba and Zalmunna to mean? Well, well, Zeba meant, means, um, well, we had a couple of different meetings for Zeba because it could mean sacrifice, but also um, uh, deprived of protection. And Zalmuna means deprived of protection. So both of them actually have the same meaning in that context according to Brown Drivers Briggs. But in Strong's, um, shade has been denied for Zamuna and sacrifice for, for Ziba. All right. If we are dealing with this as messages, There would be messages that are being given, that are being presented from the church that are the antithesis of that of Gideon and his men. Mm -hmm. Now, if shade is to be denied, Is, is shade not sought as a type of rest? Well, yeah. Um, but, but there's something about this Zeba and Zalmuna. I mean, one is they both mean the same thing. They uh, both can mean the same thing. Yeah, they can mean the same thing. Uh, but they, they come from, at it from a different direction. Um, etymologically, so they're, they're not related words. Because um, with Zalmuna, shade um, is restrained, is literally what it means, so deprived of protection. Um, but this shade here, I would look at more as God's shelter. Uh, so maybe I guess in the sense rest, but well, dwelling under the shadow of his wings, you know, that this is something that uh, there is a doctrine that the church is withholding more than anything. Um, and, and the other one meaning slaughter, um, Ziba meaning slaughter. It's kind of interesting that they give it the same meaning deprived of protection in Brown Driver Sprigs. Um, so I'm not sure why they give it that, just because the meaning means slaughter. So I'm not sure why they give it that meaning, unless this is some kind of typo. Um, Well, if they're deprived of, if they're deprived of protection, and they could be the slaughter, not the ones doing all the slaughter. Yeah, like it reminds me of of Ezekiel nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this would refer to a message from the church. The rejection, basically, of uh, of the third angel's message of the gospel. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that these are two kings of Median. Yeah. 
did God, did our heavenly father not promise a hedge of protection around Israel? Mm -hmm. And what was that hedge? Well, it's the law. And the breach in that hedge or wall is talked about in Isaiah 58. Right. Which is one of the chapters that we were mm -hmm. giving reference to yesterday. Yeah. But what of the law has been breached? Well, the Sabbath. Exactly. Yeah. So is this shade that is being restrained the understanding and how the Sabbath is to be kept? Well, that definitely would be part of it. But in trying to understand specifically how it relates to um, this message, um, when you look at uh, William Miller, and what he was teaching. Um, it was rather deep. There was a lot of things that he, he didn't really go into in detail, but one of them had to do with the 2520 and its connection to the sabbatical rest of the land. So he, he did a series on, on the Sabbaths, uh, the types, uh, the feasts, and how they related to the prophetic periods. Now, in order for Adventists to really understand the truth, because I've been I was thinking about this quite a bit, just in, in a more general sense though. Because people believe in Christ. I mean, all kinds of Christians, all kinds of Adventists, they believe in Christ in some way or other. But they're not necessarily following Christ. That is, they don't really know Christ. And Ellen White says that we must present Christ as, um, as seen in the types, in the, the typology of the sanctuary, um, in the prophetic periods as well. And I would think that, you know, the idea that the Sabbath would be proclaimed more fully isn't just that we're going to talk about the Sabbath more, but it's connection, and this goes to the study yesterday, dealing with uh, um, Exodus 31, 13, and Ezekiel 20, 12, and 20, 20, um, about the Sabbath being a sign between us and God, that we may know that he's the one that sanctifies us. So in this message that was given on July 18th, it wasn't really just a message about predicting some event on some date. It actually goes much deeper than that. And the reason why the message is rejected is because they've really rejected light completely. You know, there's very little light that the church is interested in seeing. They only want to look at the light that's going to flatter them. Because we know that true light shines in darkness, and darkness does not comprehend it. That is, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So anything that brings a rebuke is going to be rejected. And I think that's what why uh, Gideon's message is rejected, is because it is a rebuke to those who love darkness rather than light. Are we not seeing that yet within the movement as well as within the church? Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's always been the problem. Is It's really easy to see the sins in others and not to see them in yourself. I mean, I, I think, you know, in my experience, very many people, become Adventists or join offshoots in Adventism or, you know, join different groups as a way of avoiding uh, light rather than an acceptance of light. That is, we want to have beliefs 
that are going to make us seem good in our own eyes. And so people take positions on all kinds of things, not because they love light, but because they want to appear righteous in their own eyes. Um, so, so this is the problem that we have. This is the problem with Gideon's message. Is it's, it's a message that condemns those who do not accept it. Well, as, as we had looked at this 11 days ago, here is Gideon. He is given light. He is given not just light, but also a, a major unfolding of light. Mm -hmm. He tears down the idols that his father had erected, that the people of their town had chosen to worship at. All of these people understood that there is one God, one living God. And yet when they are confronted with the destruction of that which they held dear, they became angry and they wanted Gideon's demise. Mm -hmm. Gideon had to stand up on his own and when he did so it had an influence upon his father the question that we have to face is do we have the intestinal fortitude to stand up on behalf of what the light that god has given to us and to stand up before those that are presented as being higher in authority. Well, the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we truly are following it ourselves. Right. And have confidence and trust in it. So it's not something that can be manufactured. No, it can't. So Gideon here comes up to Penuel and he comes up to, to Sukkoth and he is rejected. The message that Gideon is giving is being rejected. Mm -hmm. Now on one side, he's going to tear their flesh from them. On the other, he is going to break down this tower we'll get in further into some of these symbols in a few moments now when we came to the next verse now Ziba and Zelmuna were in Karkor and their hosts with them about 15,000 men all that was left of all the hosts of the children of the east for there fell an hundred and twenty thousand men that drew the sword. That means that from one hundred and thirty five thousand, a hundred and twenty thousand fell, and the remnant was fifteen thousand. There were questions as we were to close at the last meeting of what the fifteen thousand were, but we didn't even attempt to look at the 120,000. Well, the only thing I can say is that um, if you divide 120,000 by 135,000, you get 0.8888888, et cetera, um, as a number. So I guess that's 88.88% .88 right. Uh, of the people were killed of those those men um but you have a hundred and twenty thousand and who who die and fifteen thousand that are left um now i believe it was stephen that brought this up that this fifteen thousand could be a representative of the first day of the fifth month 
Yeah, well, just as, as a symbol, yeah. First day of the fifth month. What other symbols can we derive from this? Yeah, we have noticed 120 days from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month. Mm -hmm. Right. So the 120 and the 15 would both give you that symbol from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month, which ends up being the midnight cry. So that could be the primary symbol there. Okay. I had said it was the 10th day of the fifth month. I mean, possibly because 10 plus five is 15. Right. Yeah. But why are these symbols then being applied along with the children of the East? Why would this be a symbol that would have to involve Islam? Involve in Islam? Well, we've understood that Islam is connected to Midnight of the Midnight Cry in our history, which, which we set aside with uh, November 9th and July 18th uh, afterwards. That is, we set it aside with November 9th. In July 18th, we had it attached, but it didn't occur. And so we're not necessarily placing it there now. At least I don't think we are. Unless we say that uh, an attack was averted because of our warning, which is a possibility. But, but anyway, we do have Islam attached to these way marks. Agreed. We could say it was postponed because of our warning, possibly. Yeah. Because yeah. it is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, it would. Have, yeah, that's what I meant. Averted for, for now in our line. But symbolically in our line, we had placed them there. We had placed Islam there. Now, the translators had gone into several different portions within Judges and then into Second Kings when they were looking at other verses in line with what we've just read. Judges 20, verse 2. And the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God for hundred thousand footmen that drew the soul sword four hundred thousand is a very large number <clears throat> especially when we're looking at this from judges 20 because this is where the children of israel are going up against one of their own mm -hmm. and as we addressed to begin with this particular section should be more properly placed somewhere between Judges 2 and Judges 3. Then Judges 2015. And the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities, 20 and 6,000 men that drew the sword, beside the inhabitants of Gibeah, which numbered 700 chosen men. So here we have 26,700 of those of Benjamin that are then looking to stand against 400,000. Very promising there. But what can we tell what can we tell from these symbols? How do these interrelate with what we've just looked at with the 15,000 and the 120,000? <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
And on Judges 2017, and the men of Israel beside Benjamin were numbered 400,000 men that drew the sword. All these were men of war. And Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again 18,000 men, all these that drew the sword. So this smaller group was seen as being more effective against a much larger group. But the numerical symbols have some import for us today. The question is, what? How can we, how can we address this? What do these things mean to us personally? And we went, we went through this before where we were taking a look at one chapter and laying it out as being events within the movement. What if in a reverse way, Judges 20 is events within the church? How, how would you make that application? Is it because of where it's placed? Well, I'm uh, looking. At, place? I, okay, the placement we were just addressing as needing to come between Judges 2 and Judges 3. But it's intentionally put later. Correct. For some reason. Right. So I'm looking at this and I'm asking the question as, as I'm looking at the, the numbering of this chapter. Would it be possible that Judges 20 is giving reference to events within the church against the movement from 2001 forward? That's possible, but... I'm just, I, I'm throwing this out as a suggestion. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't really figured out how to do that. Um, now, just a, a little comment about the number of men. So there's 26,000 men of the children of Benjamin um, right. and 700 of the inhabitants of Gibeah that would be added to that, right? Right. 26,700. Correct. Which for what it's worth, if it's divided by 20, is 1335. Right. So we come to a, a symbol that we see only in the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. But we also understand that those that come to the 1335 and understand that there's a blessing upon them right and the 1335 is related to the 1533 right and to the 153 correct so now again 18,000 men too so Here in 2 Kings 3.26, 
we see that, and when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, but they could not. So Gibeah sends 700 chosen men. The king of Moab had 700 chosen men that drew swords. The king of Moab failed and the men of Gibeah failed. I just find that, that these alternate verses that they use to support certain points sometimes have some interesting things for us to consider, but how are we to do this? How are we to line this out with what we have been addressing, because the message that we're given right now is one that is very personal. We need repentance before we're going to be able to go forward to give any kind of a message. We need to have complete and total reliance upon God, just as Gideon did, before we can give any kind of a message. Gideon gave a call to other members of the children of Israel, and in many ways that those calls were being rejected. Now, again, footnoting, we had seen in Judges 7, 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. They're basically saying here that this force was innumerable. They're giving a representation of almost like telling people, go count the grains of sand if you want to understand how large this opposing force has been. Okay, now from the chat, the comment is made from Daniel 12.12. 12, of the 144, of the 144,000, and also 2 Kings 1, as the 153, and assures us of God's power against enemies and the repentance of one or more of them at the third advance against us. How is one or more of the enemies repenting? I don't, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. You, you have to read the read the chapter because it says Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab, and Ahaziah apparently sent out forces to to grab grab the prophet, and he was just called down fire. You know, if I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven to devour you. And then at the third advance, the fellow who was in charge of these forces asked to be spared, and he was. So that so then I thought, well, what does this mean in our time? You know, like there's three advances. So I thought the third angel, we can expect, I guess, some of the papal forces to repent. I don't know. It's possible. I'm just guessing like I, I, I know that 153 is in there because there are three sets of 50 plus the one who was the leader of these enemies mm. yeah which we understand yeah because it hasn't happened yet so um.
Okay, any other thoughts or comments on this? Judges 8.11. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Nobah and Jogbeha and smote the horse, the host, for the host was secure. Why is this important that we note this? He goes up on the, by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east. Noba, a bark. Mm -hmm. Jogbeha, or Yogbeha, a hillock. Mm -hmm. But it's a feminine form. Mm -hmm. What do we draw from those meanings? Is this like the bark of a dog or is this the bark of a tree? No, it's the bark of a dog. It's the sound. It's, it's onomatopoeic. So, um, So he went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of the bark of the dog and the hillock and smote the host for the host was secure. Now there were other verses that were being used here. We have Numbers 32. And the children of Gad built Debon and Ataroth and Aurora and Amoth, Shopan, Jazer, and Jogbeha. And then Numbers 32 42, and Nobah went and took Kanath and the villages thereof and called it Nobah after his own name. So Nobah was a person whose name meant the bark or the, the sound of a dog. And then we have Judges 1827. And they took the things which Micah had made and the priest which he had and came unto Laish Unto a people that were at quiet and secure, they smote them with the edge of the sword and burnt the city with fire. But Paul gives us again, 1 Thessalonians 5.3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Dogs bark to give warning, to protect their, what they see as being their pack or their home. Dogs are not normally dumb. They are not normally without sound. Isaiah 56.10 speaks of dumb dogs that cannot bark, the watchman that did not give the warning. Right. So would we be looking at Noba and Jogbiha 
as being peace and safety messages that do not awaken the people? Here we have Gideon coming up by way of them that dwelt on the east of these two named areas. And he comes in to smite the host because the host felt that everything was good. They didn't need to worry about such a small force. They didn't need to be concerned about what Gideon was or what he was saying. Oh, never lay of the sea and complacent and secure, supposedly. Well, are they also not those that refuse to listen to the words of Paul? They give lip service. Everything is going to be fine. As long as you have your membership here, you're going through to the end. There's no need for personal preparation. There's no need for character development. It's all about your name being on the church books. Isn't that a type of peace and safety message that is very destructive? Completely. No way to lessen their sense of preparation. Now in the following verse we read, And when Zeba and Zalmona fled, he, Gideon, pursued after them, and took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmona, and discomfited all the host. I think the alternate reading is better. And he terrified all of the host. Well, yeah, we don't use discomfited very much anymore, but that's what it means, yeah, terrified. So <clears throat> the message that Gideon, Gideon gives creates terror with these other messages, Zeba and Zomuna. And it terrifies the host. It terrifies the members that have accepted these two messages. In 1888, the church rejected the third angel's message. They knew what the first angel's message was. They understood the second angel's message, but they could not be benefited by the third angel's message because they did not understand it. Since 1888, many have made the comment that the third angel's message was fully accepted. They're placing a spin on what really occurred. When this message, these two messages of Zeba and Zalmuna are removed, the host becomes terrified. The host begins to see their true condition. Well, that would make sense. So, But as Laodiceans, what is their true condition? Well, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. <clears throat> Isn't it interesting that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked?
being a recognition for that which we are having to come to grips with ourselves right now. When we realize our state, that should spur us to turn to God. And hopefully some in the church will do the same. When they see themselves as God sees them, then we realize our only hope is in him. Our only salvation is in him. And all of this pride of man has to be vanished. Like it has to be gotten rid of. Judges 8.13, and Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up. So was this battle occurring then at night? Or is this giving more reference that this battle, he returned from the battle before the sun is high in the sky? such as at noon. How should we see this? Well, I don't know. Um, I would think that this has to do before sunrise, not noon. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, considering was up, is a supplied phrase. Yeah, uh, well, you know, it has to do with the Hebrew more than anything. Um, now, it's just the, the word. Uh, see, this could actually refer to a place, not the sunrise at, at all, but a place called Harry's, Harry's, which is the Hebrew word for sun. Uh, so it could be the ascent or the elevation of Harry's. Okay. Um, so another way to translate it, it'd be a pass, a mountain pass. Literally, it's the ascent of Harry's. Um, so it wouldn't be noon for sure. Uh, so is this is, is this the words mil malach harris? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's close enough. Yeah. So, and Gideon and caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth and inquired of him. And he described unto him the princes of Sukkoth and the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. So this young man of Sukkoth writes out the description of the princes of Sukkoth, and there's 77 men. Uh, 87. 87? Oh, no. Wait, 77. Three scores at 60 plus 17. Okay. Yeah, so that would be 77. You're correct. So we have 77 being brought up here in Scripture. Mm -hmm. What's the import of 77? Well, we see it as a shorthand for 777. Right. I look at it as well personally because that's the year I graduated high school, which graduating from the academy in 1977. Mm -hmm. So whenever I see 77, I, st I still tend to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we have attached it to the symbol of the 777 structure. <clears throat> okay. So it becomes a shorthand for that. 
So when we're attaching it to the 777, we're attaching it to that of Noah's father, Lamech, right? Mm -hmm. And what else are we attaching this to? Well, the July 18, 2020 prediction and the 2520. Because that's the 65 and 187 years, which is 252 years attached to the 777 years. So those symbols are then attached to our, our history, our structure. Okay. <clears throat> And he came unto the men of Sukkoth and said, Behold, Zeba and Zalmunna, with whom ye did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thy men that are weary? The men of Sukkoth ask, Why should we help you when you haven't accomplished anything? And now, now they, they go ahead. Now they have. And now, now he he and his host, his three hundred, have accomplished the capture of Zeba and Zomun. They're reminded of their attitude, of their their rude words, and their belief that they were right in rejecting the message of Gideon. <clears throat> when we look at this a little further, again, we're, we're, we're giving this reference back. And the princes of Sukkot said, are the hands of Zeba and Zomunna now in thine hand that we should give bread unto thine army? Why should we support your message? We don't agree with it. We don't see that you've accomplished anything. Is this not the same attitude that we saw with the message of July 18th? And he took the elders of the city and the thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he made to know the men of Sukkoth. He taught the men of Sukkoth. That would have been one very painful instruction. Yeah, so they're whipped by these thorns. <clears throat> so... At least I think that's what's implied. I, I would agree. But as they're being whipped by these thorns, as they're enduring the pain of the message that they have rejected, what other symbol are we seeing here? He's not taking all the men. He's taking only the leaders, the elders of the city. So we have applied that Zeba and Zalmunna of the Midianites are that of the messages of the church. Are the elders of the city here of Sukkoth those of the movement that have chosen to separate from learning according to Miller's rules? Yeah, and so the instruction, the discipline that they're going to receive, why is it with thorns and briars from the desert? What else do we see coming from the desert? 
Do we not see the children of the east coming from the desert? Mm -hmm. So see drought. Repeat, please. The desert represents the uh, no water drought. Okay. Well, this is the wilderness as well. So, I mean, yeah. I, I would think it refers to line upon line. Well, <clears throat> over the last several weeks, there have been a lot of presentations that have been given by other groups. I'm receiving a lot of emails about different videos that I should watch, different things that I should consider. I have to look at where my time is best spent. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say I spend every moment in study. But there are so many things that are being presented right now, especially many fanciful things, that we have to decide where, our, where is our heart and in what do we have faith? Well, part of the thing that I was thinking about, because I didn't really think directly about the studies, I thought a little bit more uh, broadly or generally, um, just regarding um, understanding truth. Because, you know, the big problem that we have is we have a lot of light. But to, to present this to others, I, I don't see how you can. Other than that God speaks to people sometimes in ways that... Uh, is not purely intellectual. That is, people go through experiences. God prepares people to receive light. And I think a lot of what's happening, of what has happened throughout my experience in Adventism, is that people reject light for the simple reason they want to do what they want to do, but they want to appear righteous in the eyes of others and in the eyes of themselves. So the message that God has been giving this movement goes contrary to human nature. It's not well received. But in the end, it is a rebuke. And the only thing that we can do is obey it. I mean, we have to, of course, study it and we have to present it the best that we can. But God will lead the people who are interested in this message to this message. But sadly, many of the people who have been in this message, maybe all of us, have not really appreciated this message. So we have these, these various enemies, which are our belief system, and these have to be removed. We have to be corrected. Okay. <clears throat> that's pretty kind of hard to do. <laughs> as, as, a, as an experimenter, um, you have preconceived notions when you go into the experiment that may or may not be um, factual. And it's through the experimentation that you find the facts and you have to divest yourself of those um, preconceived notions, which are kind of hard to do because they're kind of ingrained uh, from what you know, you know, what you've heard or what you've seen. In, in the course of your life. Um, but it can be done. Yeah, it can be done. 
<clears throat> now, as we as we come to the next verse, and he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. So uh, Penuel, as we all know, um, has to do with seeing the face of God, right? Okay. And, um, but this is the Tower of Penuel. Correct. And a, a tower is a, a migdal. Right? So we've run into this word migdal before as well. Right. Um, so if he's going to beat down the Tower of Penuel, um, I mean, this is a special place. So would this be the church structure? Well, it, it, it was, um, you know, the other city, uh, he, he took the elders and whipped them. And in this one, he slays all the men. Mm -hmm. Is this significant? It has to be significant because there's nothing insignificant in scripture. I get that. <laughs> so Penuel, again, is the face of God, and the tower we know to be uh, like Migdal. Um, what's the connotations there? That a, is that something like the tower falling on the men or <laughs> grasping for straws here? Well, we have different ex we, we have different examples of tower throughout the Bible. If we were to use Miller's rules here, <clears throat> we would need to look at every verse that has anything to do with towers and then to take a look at this being the tower of the face of god does that make sense yes so <clears throat> when we go to look at this If we look at the words, we have 50 different references. <clears throat> so we have a rostrum, a bed of flowers, a castle, a pulpit, a tower. is what the, the word is used for. Kind of strange, bed of flowers. That's, <laughs> that's kind of strange. It is, uh, it's interesting what some of these words mean, does, isn't it? Yeah, yes. So the first time we find this word, we find it in Genesis 11. As we would colloquially call it the Tower of Babel. Yeah. We then find it in Genesis 35, 21. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the Tower of Adar, or the Tower of a Flock. Migdal Adar. Yeah, Edar. Edar, okay. We then have several verses that we'll deal, and we're going to come up to again in the next chapter in Judges 9. <clears throat> and then we come to 2 Kings 9, verse 17. 
And there stood a watchman on the tower of Jezreel, and he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, take an horseman and send to meet them and say, is it peace? Now, it's interesting to me because the next time this comes up, we have 2 Kings 17.9. Same numbers, different order. And the children of Israel did secretly these things that were not right against the Lord their God. <clears throat> and they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. <clears throat> from the tower of the watchman. The tower, the migdal of the warning. And then 2 Kings 18.8. 8. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza and the borders thereof from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. Towers look to be important places. When we come to Song of Songs, we begin to see the same word translated as flowers because it's not towers. Well, yeah, I don't know why they would translate it as flowers, but that's how they translated it. In Ezekiel 26, we talk of the towers. where they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her <clears throat> like the top of a rock. Later, and he shall set engines of war against thy walls and with his axes, he shall break down thy towers. From just these few then God, uh, God calls his forces the battle axe, right? So that's what comes to me when you mention that. All right. From these few of the 50 verses that there are on towers, what can we see about? the symbol of a tower. That is a place for the watchman. Exactly. And why is it important that the tower is the place for the watchman? So they can see all around. So that they have a calzone vision. A clear vision. <laughs> Well, a panoramic, yeah, a panoramic vision. I get it. Okay. If the watch. I haven't thought of it like quite like that before, but yeah, that is a, that's a very descript or good description of, of what they do is they see the, the Caldone vision, calzone, excuse me, calzone vision. Very descript. If they don't accept the calzone vision, how can they ever accept and truly understand the mare and the mara? Can't be done. It'd be sure luck if they hit on it. If you don't understand the calzone, the seven times, you don't see how important the vision of the evening and the morning 
that is true really is. And you will not understand the vision of the looking glass that makes you look directly at yourself in comparison with Christ. Right. So <clears throat> when he beats down the tower of Penuel and he slays the men of the city, can this not also be tied with Ezekiel 9? Because we're, we're oh. making, excuse me. Yes, I can see that. The face of God, Penuel, well, the church is supposed to represent God and is doing a very poor job of it mainly, but so are we, so am I. I mean, I, I had to get convicted by the Lord to go over and treat somebody today, and I grabbed all the meds that I have that helped me when I had this thing, and as soon as this study is over, I'm going to go over it, because I didn't want to do it. Like, I've been inviting these people to these messages for some time, and there's always an excuse now I'm going to bring stuff to them and just sit there and read to them, I guess, while this person recovers. Well, <clears throat> the point that, that I'm, I'm considering in this, in this section, we have established that, the, that Ezekiel 9 is not men carrying literal swords, but they are carrying a message. And that message is to begin at the house of God. If Gideon is beating down the tower of Penuel, is he not giving a judgment upon the watchmen that are supposed to be defending the face of God? And just like what we saw in Ezekiel 9, the men clothed with linen with the slaughtering weapon in their hands were to go through the whole city. The only ones that would be saved would be those that were sighing and crying for the abominations thereof. Here is Gideon beating down this tower the migdal of the face of God. So he is destroying that which their watchmen had used. And the same message is then slaying the men of the city where the tower of the face of God had been. Is there another example that we can apply here? Now, <clears throat> before we, we took our break, one of the questions that was asked is, have we addressed the meanings of some of these symbols, especially some of the numeric symbols? Are we comfortable as a group today with what we've addressed with the numeric symbols and the interpretation that we have placed upon this today? The three, 300 men, I was reading through, through the Gospels recently, and I noticed, really noticed for the first time, where Judas had reproved Jesus regarding the ointment, right? And he said, why wasn't the spikenard sold and given to the poor? It was worth 300 pence or something like that. Right. And I was one, there was a connection between that 300 and Gideon's forces of 300 therefore us having to do with us i you know i just stood out to me well the 300 pence that was used there 
a pence, of course, was a day's wages. Right? Yeah. So we're talking <clears throat> about a, an amount that is 80% of a year's wages, roughly. That's a lot of money to have all at one time at that, at that point in history. So we have Gideon's 300 men, we have 300 pence, but we also have the 15,000 and the 120,000. So if we, if we additively were looking at, at that force of the 15,000 plus the 120,000, we would have 135,000. And as, as was being said, this could be a symbol of the 1335 or the 1533. Could it also be a symbol of the 13th day of the fifth month? Would that have any import? I don't know about that. Okay. Um, the fifth day of the 13th month, when there are 13 months in the Jewish year. Okay. Um, comment? Please. Uh, I, I, I don't ever recall us discussing this. And it kind of popped into my mind the last time I heard the 300 name, the number. Right. Because uh, we had 300 plus one. Right. We had 301. Um, have we ever considered the implications of the 300 in Millerite time? And the one which was Miller, they had 300 charts made up. So we know they had 300 preachers uh, and the one being Miller. Have we ever made any kind of um, comparison with that? So would that be placing Miller as Gideon and the 300 as the, the rest of his of his group well, well miller used a chart so there wouldn't be 300 plus one there okay but, all right acceptable because there was 300 charts made that's right there, there was 300 charts made and same with the 1850 chart they also made 300. but the 1850 chart did not include miller uh, in his preaching no, but it was just the it was just the the charts. There are three hundred charts. Yeah, there's three hundred charts. But Miller, still... Miller used a chart. I'm just saying. So yeah. Miller was one of the one of the preachers. Well, he had his own charts at the beginning, from what I could see. No, no, he didn't. Well, what were those things in the back of the book? Um, I considered them to be charts, not necessarily like the ones that we see. The, the yeah, he didn't put up a he didn't put up a chart behind him. Well, didn't he have but lines uh, with arcs in them, kind of like the way we make it? Um, well, not that I know of, um, unless there's something I, I, I've never seen. He had his materials that people purchased. And, and there was one chart made uh, just prior to the 1843 chart. Um, that's the one with the 2450, the 2520, and the 2300 on it. But Miller used the 1843 chart. That's my understanding of it. Well, I, 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 before the, for, the the chart came out, he was he was demonstrating. Um, time spans, or at least that's the way I, 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 I applied it because of, we got the book that he, uh, I, 
somebody else wrote, but it was about him, I think. And inside that book, like at the back of it, he had um, a bunch of, of lines established and dates and um, mm. uh, yeah, I just don't. I just don't think he had printed charts. That's all I'm saying. No, no, he didn't have the charts like we but, have. No. But anyway, the point is, there was 300 charts made, and Miller used used those charts. He was one of those 300. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So there may be nothing to this. Because I was just thinking about the number, the 300. Well, That's the 300 is important, yeah. So we recognize the 300 charts in Millerite history. And also in early Adventist history, the 300 1850 charts. So Stephen has pointed out in the chat, um, Enoch is taken to heaven 300 years after he begets Methuselah. So the 144,000 are also taken, potentially linking 144,000 to 300, and therefore Gideon's 300. So yeah, so the 300 charts are important symbols. Now, do we have then a 300 in as a symbol in our li our line? I don't well, recall that we've that's ever. That's kind of my question. Hmm. I don't see that we've ever we've ever used the three hundred in our line at this point. Yeah, I don't see but one reference for my in my notes, and and that was that was just on the charts themselves. Mm -hmm. I I don't see any other references to three hundred in my notes. Other than this to, one here, the Gideon's notes or Gideon. You got to, you got to thirty. You got to thirty years. Yeah, the thirty years. So you're okay. saying the thirty years from uh, 1989 to 2019? No, I was talking about the thirty years Jesus was in preparation to give the message he gave. Yeah, but we have 1989 to 2019. Okay. okay. That, that, that I was just thinking about Jesus in his yeah. 30 years. But we have a 30 as well. Okay. As well as uh, a 12. Yeah, but I don't think I've ever seen the 300 uh, talked about in our lines. Well, I always thought the 300 represent, the, represent 30. You could take the zero off and it'd be 30. Wouldn't it? We have done that. Mm -hmm. That's just my thinking. It could be wrong. That's interesting, though, to consider the 300 as being an interrelation with the 144,000. Okay. Now, there was another observation I've made recently. Um, well, actually, it wasn't recently. It was about 25 years ago. Um, I most of the my understanding um, has been facilitated by a computer. Um, and when I started this, uh, the 1.44 um, floppy, right? Um, it just, I don't know, I was sitting at the table one time and reading and 144,000 came up and I looked over at the floppy pile and there's a bunch of 1.44 discs and I'm thinking 144, 144,000. And now I, I, I went a little further and researched when that, 
that came out, which was in 86, which was before 89. Um, I almost want to say that we're the product of the, uh, uh, the movement is um, the product of, of, or not the product of, but facilitated by the computer. We have information available to us that nobody's ever had before in times past. <laughs> And it just, it was just a, a thought, a passing thought, you know, the 144, we were, it was happening before 1989. Um, Jeff was, was when that all started. And again, we're the product of this computerized generation, because again, we would never have the information available to us sitting in our home prior to uh, the advent of the computer or personal computer. That's all I got to say because I spent a lot of time in the library prior to that before before I ever got my first computer. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of time. I get it's slow. a lot slower. It's a lot slower process working in a library than it is on a computer. Oh, I'm trying to tell you, man. It's it's yeah. it's it's so Change. much faster now. I mean, it's almost instantaneous. Yeah, it would take sometimes uh, days of searching in a library to find what I can find in minutes. On a computer, yeah, and just by doing a word search, usually, mm -hmm. and that's why I, I've taken all those, um, uh, all of our studies that we've done, and I've reduced them to a word documents um, every, you know, every session, and I oftentimes uh, do searches and through my files, and come up with multiple hits on it, and then have to go through them to find these things that we talk about. Um, but it assists me in finding that stuff a lot faster than before because I, I was just, I had it in my memory. You know what I'm saying? Where did I, where did I see that thing? Oh, what was that? What, was it Luther that I read? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, anyway so the point is the, the question because we're running out of time here, but. I'm sorry. Uh, so the symbols, we have all these numbers, these symbols. And, you know, are we satisfied that we have thoroughly understood them? And I would have to say no. But we understand quite a few. I agree. Okay. So, as as we've gone through today's study and as we've come to the end of today's time, do we have any other thoughts or comments at this point? Okay, we will resume to study tomorrow in Judges 8.18. Shall we now close with prayer? Yeah. Loving Father in heaven, we need your direction. We need your guidance so that we may be able to come before you. We need you now. As we go through the rest of this day, help us to consider these examples and these lessons that have been presented before us. Direct us so that we may surrender and understand our greater need of you and of your character in our lives. Be with us each one today, guide us so that those with whom we come in contact may see you and not us in all that is done. We thank you for the blessings of this word. We thank you for the blessings of fellowship, of being able to study together Help and prepare us for that which we are to encounter. For this we thank you and this we praise you. Now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.